Hey everybody, it's d here. Thanks so much for listening to the Mormon News Roundup. If you haven't heard about Anchor by Spotify, it's the easiest way to make a podcast with everything you need all in one place. Allow me to explain. Anchor has the tools that allow you to record and edit your podcast right from your phone or computer. When hosting on Anchor, you can distribute your podcast on listening platforms like Spotify, Apple Podcasts, and more. It's everything that you need to make a podcast all in one place. And best of all, Anchor is totally free. So download the Anchor app or go to anchor.fm to get started. Ladies and gentlemen, kicking off the first stop on his world tour, our new president and prophet, Russell M. Nelson! You say you want some revelation, well here you go. It's gonna blow your freaking mind. Hey, welcome back, brothers and sisters. We are uh, here with the weekly Mormon News Roundup, where Dives and Al ruminate on the great and spacious beehive. We've got a really exciting episode this week. A lot of big news in Mormondom for August 22nd, 2022. This will be episode 21 for us. Um, we have a visitor uh, with us today. Professor John Turner is joining the show. And uh, we're going to be going over some of the continued fallout from the church sex abuse scandal. Uh, the church is also trying to avoid tax liabilities and venture capitalism. And a judge has tossed out the $250 million church Boy Scout settlement. And we're going to give you an update on that. And what President Russell M. Nelson can learn from Victoria's Secret. So this will be an exciting show. We're excited for it. I uh, do want to give you a little bit of a trigger warning. We'll be discussing child abuse and sexual assault, but uh, we won't go into too many details. So it, it, we're going to keep it pretty light. Yeah, tremendous. Uh, uh, Dr. Dr. John Turner, he's joining the program this week, and he writes, teaches, and speaks about the place of religion in American history. He's a professor of religious studies at George Mason University in Fairfax, Virginia, and he's the author of Brigham Young, Pioneer Prophet. Uh, uh, Dr. Turner, welcome to the Mormon News Roundup. Thanks for having me. Glad to be with you guys. Great. Hey, what should we call you, by the way? Well, John is totally acceptable. I'm called many worse things than that <laughs> <laughs> all right john it is <laughs> that sounds great glad to have you john um so much of your scholarly works revolve around mormonism and uh, what makes the followers of joseph smith jr so interesting to you because um you're a presbyterian yourself right that is correct yeah I, you know i mean i guess i'll try to give you the shortish version um okay. you know i think i think if you're a historian of religion in the united states it's somewhat hard not to at least get a little bit interested in the Mormon story. You know, the 19th century story is just so remarkable in terms of, you know, prophets, persecution, polygamy, exodus, you know, conflict between church leaders in Utah and the U.S. government, settlement of the West. You know, I mostly, you know, I really mostly know about the church in the 19th century, but I also, I do find contemporary Mormonism fascinating um, as well. Yeah, uh, that westward movement is certainly an exciting story, and also the lead up to that. Um, when I say the west, westward movement, I should say everything from uh, the church forming in Palmyra and then going all the way to Utah. So I agree with you. Very compelling story uh, to be had there. Yeah, uh, John, my daughter currently attends George Mason University, so uh, go Patriots. And, uh, you know, can you tell us about the uh, religious studies program at uh, GMU that you oversee? Sure. I mean, oversee is sort of a, a light word, I guess. I don't know. Um, so, you know, it's a sort of standard uh, religious studies department at a public secular university, which I think is, you know, at George Mason it's a great place to study religion. You know, I mean, every university in the country talks so much about how much they value diversity, but we, I think we actually have a ton of diversity in, in all sorts of ways at, at George Mason. We have a, you know, we have a pretty large Muslim student population, but, you know, we have large uh, populations of a lot of other immigrant groups in the DC region. And one of the great things about religious studies is, you know, you can find a common ground um, for people of all sorts of different backgrounds to discuss, you know, fascinating aspects of religion, texts, ritual, history. And, you know, sometimes, you know, I think people have this idea that people from different backgrounds are just going to endlessly fight over this kind of stuff. But my experience is in the classroom. It's actually 
there, there are ways to, to find, you know, form a community that can talk about those kinds of things together. That's excellent to hear, John, because that's really what uh, we try to do here on the Mormon News Roundup is we try to provide a place where uh, people, uh, whether you're a believer, non-believer, uh, if you just have interest in Mormonism itself, uh, I think that there's a place for anybody here. Uh, so we appreciate you being with us. Now, um, I myself live in a much less diverse place. I live in Utah, um, and I understand that uh, recently you visited the Beehive State. Uh, so uh, what what was your uh, thoughts about um, my home state here? Your home state? Well, you know, I've spent a number of summers in Utah over mm -hmm. the years, and I have to say I love summering uh, in Utah. Where in the state are you, mm -hmm. Al? I, I'm up on the north side. Yeah. Okay. So we I, we were mostly based in Provo, and I also okay. have a sister in Park City, mm -hmm. but, you know, which is quite lovely in the summer. Boy, it uh, sure so is. I, I had a I had a fellowship at the Maxwell Institute at BYU, mm -hmm. oh. and so I also spent a lot of time in archives, mostly in Salt Lake, some some at BYU as well. So I really we had a blast. We drove all the way out mm -hmm. to Utah from Virginia, which was a little much. Yeah, it is. That's quite wanted, a drive. We wanted to take our dog, who uh -huh. liked summering in Utah even more than we did. But, mm -hmm. you know, we had a great time. BYU, BYU Creamery becoming mm -hmm. re-familiarized with things like fry sauce, visiting mm -hmm. some new places in the state like Delta. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, we, we had a really good time. Yeah, for sure. Um, I've never been to Delta myself, but um, my wife and I would keep talking about uh, heading down there and uh, visiting Topaz Mountain uh, to see that. So, yeah, I'm glad that uh, you enjoyed your time uh, here in the Beehive State. And um, yeah, this is a certainly exciting to talk to somebody that, um, you know, from such a diverse place as George Mason University and uh, Washington, D.C. itself. So we're certainly glad to have you here. Um, what current uh, or future projects do you have uh, uh, planned here, John? I'm working on a biography of Joseph Smith. You've probably heard of him. Mm -hmm. Once upon a time. So that's, <laughs> that's, uh, that's occupying me. It's, you know, I mean, he didn't live as long as Brigham Young, so in theory it should be mm -hmm. easier, but mm -hmm. it's, it's not easy. He's, he's a tough nut to crack. Yeah, I mean, they really crammed a lot of life into his short lifespan that was ended very tragically, very early. I think he was probably as surprised as anybody when uh, he didn't make it out of Carthage. So, yeah, excellent project. Yeah, well, we'll be looking forward to reading that, John. Uh, I just have a, a couple last questions for you. You know, I've taught at a number of uh, institutions of higher education, including BYU, uh, University of Utah, and, and several others. So I've actually never taught a religion course in higher education, but I was a LDS uh, Sunday school president, though. So I do have a personal question for you, and I know we discussed this just a little bit once before. Uh, what's standing in the way uh, of me teaching the Intro to Mormonism course at uh, GMU? I guess me. <laughs> no. <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I think technically the rule the rule is that you're you know you can hire someone as a as a part time instructor um, if that individual has I think eighteen hours of graduate credits in the subject area or something close to, closely related. So we can talk about that okay. uh, down the road. Yeah, I've taught that class a couple of times at George Mason. You know, honestly, it's it's. You know, there's certain courses that you have a sort of a large natural constituency for on campus. So we've needed to attract more students uh, to that course. So particularly if you could bring, I don't know, 15 students along with you, that would make it a lot easier. Wow. Well, that's a tall order, but at least you're telling me that there's a chance. Uh, so I'll, there's, I'll... Always, there's always hope. <laughs> okay, that's great. <laughs> That's a lot better chance than I've got. Um, I doubt they'd even let me on to James Mason University, where basically all they do is teach you how to talk like Sir James Mason. Um, that's you know, a really poor joke there. Way to go, Al. <laughs> oh, I, I'm not familiar with that one. I'm uh, James, I've heard of James Madison University, uh, but I'm not James no, Mason University. J J James Mason, he was this actor from the um, mid-1900s. He uh, played Captain Nemo in 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. Okay, this uh, is yeah. a very advanced, this is an extremely advanced joke here. Yeah, exactly. Okay. This was, I, I was reaching way too far there. Okay, all right, we got it. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, uh, John, anything else that you'd like to to share with us about your personal or religious life or your professional life before we continue oh let's see i mean you you know 
I don't know, my life's not that thrilling. Um, you know, outside of, outside of writing and teaching. Um, yeah. I mean, I, we belong to a local Presbyterian church. You know, I grew up Presbyterian. I, I, you know, the, the Presbyterian church, at least the, the largest branch of has declined precipitously over my lifetime. So it's possible that by, by the time I get to the end of my life, I will be the last remaining Presbyterian in the United States. Wow. Um, you know, you never know. It's actually kind of funny. If you think back in the early 1800s, um, yeah. you know, you think of early Mormonism, you know, such this tiny religious minority in the United States. And there were lots of these well-established Protestant denominations like the Presbyterians. And I think today in the U.S., there are probably three, t four times as many Latter-day Saints as Presbyterians. So it's, it's interesting how things change over time. Oh, there's like 8 million Mormons in the United States. How many Presbyterians? Probably if you add, added up all of the different, you know, Protestants are great at schisms. Mm. So if you added them all up, I don't know, 2 million at the most, I'd say. Okay. Uh, well, we're uh, honored to have you on the program, and we are gonna, uh, we're going to—we're really grateful that you're here. And uh, we're going to jump right into our first article here, which is uh, from BYU Official Updates. And this really uh, was making the rounds here. Um, we'll, we'll share these links in the show notes, by the way. And uh, we're on, uh, by the way, mormonnewsroundup.org. We have a website, www.mormonnewsroundup.org. Or you can send us an email to kolob at mormonnewsroundup.org. That's K-O-L-O-B at mormonnewsroundup.org. Uh, and this is the BYU Official Updates. And uh, Al, uh, can you read this tweet out? This was on August 19, 2022, 3.41 p.m. This is really taking Twitter by a storm. Yeah, let me pull this up real quick. <clears throat> okay, so it says, BYU updates the honor code to allow LGBT plus students to make limited romantic eye contact with each other once per semester. Oh, it's um, about time. I know. I, I, it doesn't say if they've uh, designated a particular day or time when they can do it, but it does say that they're allowed to now. I would hope that it would be during the weekly devotional. That's That seems like the best time to do it. Um, and and I, the people are saying that God truly answers prayers and that Jillian Orr and Matt Easton are absolutely thrilled over this, uh, you know. Uh, but this, of course, this is the parody account. Uh, this is a, at BYU Parody, and this is our Mormon joke of the week here. This is just a parody mm -hmm. account. But it's 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 hilarious to see some of the replies because some people don't see this uh, parody account. It looks so much like the official account that some people can't tell the difference. And so you see all these comments on there that people say, oh, it's it's it, this is an answer to my prayers, and I can't believe this wasn't true. And uh, it's just mm -hmm. it's so funny. Uh, <laughs> so uh, if you if you want to get a kick out there, go ahead and follow at BYU Parody because they have a lot of hilarious. Uh, uh, takes out there. So that is our Mormon joke of the week. Now on Anchor, uh, John, we have a poll that goes along with every one of our podcasts. This is episode number 21. And we have a kind of an unusual uh, Mormon News Roundup poll this week that we'd like you to uh, take. And also our listeners out there, if you'll head on over to Anchor and uh, participate in this poll, uh, I'll, uh, the, the, the poll is, what is the most important LDS-related news story in the last few years? Um, speaking of maybe the last four or five years. So uh, we want to get your opinion on this, John. Uh, and then also, Al, I want to know what you think is the most important article. And did I get the correct articles or did I leave something out? Let's find out. Uh, what's answer number one, Al? Um, okay. Number one is the Enzyme Peak from 2019 IRS whistleblower complaint highlighting a secretive hundred million, or sorry, hundred billion dollar investment fund. Oh, you, uh, so you yeah, that was you had big the, breaking news. I had a uh, uh, Elder Bednar moment there. Yeah, you <laughs> did have an Elder Bednar. Switching the bees, the, the 100 million versus the 100 billion. Yeah, when uh, Elder Bednar did the National Press Club briefing back in May of 22 out here in Washington, D.C., John, he slipped and said that it was only a $100 million uh, investment fund, but the Deseret News uh, corrected that to a $100 billion fund. So is that the number one or is it number two? Number two, policy of exclusion. Uh, this was a big one back in 2015, the policy barring uh, children of gay parents from full church participation. I know that one yeah. caused a lot of uh, upheaval. Yeah, it did. It caused a lot of uh, news. There was a, that was a big story at the time. Of course, that's been repealed. Uh, for, for the most part, it's been repealed. 
Yeah. Or is it number three? Uh, number three, the Associated Press 2022 Child Sexual Abuse Investigation. Uh, this is kind of the current uh, one that's uh, revealing systematic reporting failures and cover-ups. Yeah, this uh, is definitely the biggest news story of this year. I think that's safe to say, it, right? It's the latest. Is it the greatest? Uh, well, we'll, we'll find out. What Or is it number four? Number four, President Russell Nelson's 2018 de-emphasis of the word Mormon. Hashtag major victory for Satan. Right. That was a pretty big surprise there that uh, that the, the the word Mormon was going to be de-emphasized so much after uh, almost 200 years of using it rather liberally. Or is it number five? Number five, severing ties with the Boy Scouts of America in 2018. Um, yeah, I mean, the church was involved with the Boy Scouts for, I don't know, what was it, like 90 years? Maybe oh, more? yeah, I don't forever. Know. Uh, the, the LDS Church was, uh, I think, one of the major contributors to the Boy Scouts of America yeah, for a I long say time. I want to say that the, the church represented like 75% of all the Boy Scouts in America mm -hmm. were Mormons. Yeah, it seemed I, like uh, the church saw the writing on the wall and decided they were going to jump out of the Boy Scouts before that whole scandal came down. Yeah, baby. Yeah. Or, or is it number six? Uh, number six, reducing church time from three to two hours in 2018. That's a um, pretty big deal. That was pretty big news. I mean, that had been a three-hour block session of uh, church every week for a long time. That's since a long like time what? Ago church. Got to yeah. be since like 1975 or so. At, at least, and I think that the, the reason that they put it all in a three-hour block time then is they ha actually had it broken up over the course of like the week. They'd have like Sunday school on Wednesday nights, or you know, and things like that. And, yeah, primary during the week. Uh -huh. Yeah, mm -hmm, exactly. Absolutely. I think that was around 1975, which is where they started mm -hmm. the three-hour block. I'll have to do some mm -hmm. fact-checking. I, I was think you're right. Around yeah. that. It was sometime in the mid-70s for sure. Yeah. Or um, is it number seven? Number seven, the inspired launch of the Mormon News Roundup in April 2022. Hashtag for our day. Very, very much for our day. John, which do you think uh, is, first of all, did I capture the, the top news stories of the last five years? And if, if not, what did I leave out? Or if so, what do you think is the biggest uh, Mormon-related news story of the last few years? Well, you know, those first three all seem really significant. I mean, I'm, I'm not going to pick something that just broke a couple of weeks ago. Um, so I think I'm going to go with number two. Okay. But Policy just, of exclusion. Yeah, and, and partly because, as you suggested, you know, that is something that, you know, played out over a longer period of time with some twists and turns. And so, and, and you know, that's been such a live issue within the church for, you know, a longer stretch of time. So I'm going with number two. Very nice. Good answer. Al, what did I uh, capture all of the, the most important news stories? I think uh, so. Yeah, okay. I, I, I think you've got the, the, the top six anyway. Number seven, um, I mean, that's certainly a big one for you and me. Uh, it, is, it, uh, is it us? <laughs> hey, it could, be the, it could be the stone cut out of the mountain without hands, Al. You, you know, could, could roll full to fill the whole earth. Yeah, certainly could. So um, that's that's a possibility. Um, I'd have to I'd have to agree it's with not John. A probability. Yeah. <laughs> oh, what was that, John? What did you say? It's not a probability. Okay. okay. <laughs> hey, jo Joseph Smith said that he was a rough stone rolling. So <laughs> hey, he he people people when they when they summed Joseph Smith up, you know, uh, back in uh, the 1820s, they never thought that he would have the uh, largest uh, uh, church in, in America either. So you know, uh, fastest yeah. fastest growing church in America. So you can't judge a book by its cover you never know uh but what do yeah. you think uh what do you think there al which is the most important you, one you know I, I have to go with the ones that uh seem to have more of a broad impact more like the ones that impact more people um so I, whereas number six you could say the reducing of the church time from three to two hours that certainly affects every active member of the lds church mm -hmm. um so that was big news as far as the church goes but as far as the world goes i think probably the biggest num uh, the biggest one was number one the uh 2019 uh, Enzyme Peak IRS whistleblower complaint, uh, revealing that the actual value that the church uh, has in its uh, pockets is over $100 billion. And I don't think before then anybody really knew just how wealthy the church itself is. But that well, was a big one. Yeah, you had the Time Magazine. Think back to 1996. You had the Time Magazine mm -hmm. with the uh, Mormon Inc. You remember mm -hmm. that news cover there? Mm -hmm. Yes, I do. Mm -hmm. And, and at that time, the Time Magazine said that the church was worth forty billion dollars back in 1996. So, I mean, they had a decent idea. That was probably okay. actually pretty accurate. 
that was yeah. probably a pretty accurate assessment at the time. So um, I, I just think it's it's. I personally think that it might be the word Mormon, because mm -hmm. as you said, not everybody yeah. even knows, not everyone has heard about Ensign Peak, not everyone has heard about the policy of exclusion, and not everybody goes to church, but everybody has heard the word Mormon. And now that that word is not being used, that's a worldwide deal. You know, so I, I personally, I'm glad to see that we have three different answers. That's great. Um, because now, now nobody can accuse us of colluding. So, <laughs> mm -hmm. <Yep. laughs> so that's good. Okay. So our listeners go over to anchor. You can take the poll. We want to hear what you think are the biggest stories of the last few years. Now, a couple of follow-ups from uh, the last week, before we get into our featured news story for this week, which of course is the continued fallout from the AP story detailing the church's response to sex abuse. I want to talk about the Mormon news podcasting world, which is a very sh uh, small world. You have Probably the biggest uh, the biggest kingpin in Mormon news podcasting is the church's official uh, uh, account, and then followed immediately by This Week in Mormons. Now, I went and listened last week to This Week in Mormons, uh, their podcast. And this, again, this sex abuse scandal, the AP sex abuse scandal, I think we can all agree. Uh, I don't want to put words in your mouth, but it's probably the biggest news story since Enzyme Peak in 2019. And This Week in the Mormons spent six minutes of an hour and a half podcast on it, six minutes on sex abuse, but 10 minutes on BYU campus food offerings in the alumni magazine. I'm just wondering what, uh, that makes me wonder what are the priorities here and what is eternally important? Let me tell you that BYU alumni magazine, which I get by the way, I love the food issue. That is a nice issue. I get that. But I, I just wonder why are we spending uh, so much more time on food than um, this very, very important news story. Mm -hmm. um, and they said, you know, when it comes to, by the way, I listened to their whole episode. They said, well, you know, when it comes to church, the church is a big ship and it can't and it can't turn on a dime. Um, so it's going to take a while to respond to this stuff, uh, to the AP story uh, in the very limited amount that they covered it. And honestly, I think that that statement would be a lot more applicable to Islam, which basically has no hierarchy or maybe more true of Christianity in general, which is very diverse and, and really, really hard to wrangle. I mean, if Joel yeah. Holstein, if he makes a pronouncement or some Islamic uh, cleric issues a fatwa, those can be ignored. But if Russell M. Nelson says we're all going back to Missouri to reclaim Zion, you're going to see some serious movement. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Yeah, very, very organized, very centralized uh, power structure in the LDS church compared to these other uh, religions. Yeah. Uh, so if you read their episode outline, Al, will you read their episode outline for this last week? This is what their headline was for this last week. Sure. Uh, Mitt Romney admits to bending the truth for politics in the past. President Nelson dedicates the Washington, D.C. temple and bad dating tips. Um, is, uh, are those really the most important news articles for the week? Um, well, I, I, well I'll, I'll give them that, uh, president Nelson's, uh, dedicating the Washington DC temple. That's a pretty big uh, story. Mitt Romney, hmm, you know, he, he keeps popping his head up. Um, he's, uh, a, a Utah Senator right now. And, uh, you know, he, he just keeps, uh, you know, coming up in the news from time to time. He's, but uh, bad dating tips, is that really uh, big news? I don't know. I, I just, I'm asking both of you, why don't you think that a quote unquote faithful podcast wants to discuss the AP sex abuse scandal uh, very much? Why do you uh, think? They, they might be wanting to, you know, bide their time, wait to see how it fleshes out. And, you know, if it goes away, then they won't have to address it at all, right? So. I guess so. Um, I, I can speculate, too. I, I, I think that it's because the church has taught in the past some of the following. Um, they, uh, it, quote, it is wrong to criticize leaders of the church, even if the criticism is true, end quote. That's a famous quote by President uh, 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 Oaks. Or, uh, and, and members also make covenants in the temple not to, quote, unquote, speak evil of the Lord's anointed. That's kind of a big deal. And also we had in the uh, formerly back in the new era, but now it's the Enzyme magazine, uh, the, I'm not, sorry, not the new era, the improvement era. Yeah, the improvement era. Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, improvement era. It was when the prophet speaks, the debate is over. And that kind of legendary uh, tagline, you still hear it in general conference today. Mm -hmm. So yeah. because, because little can be said that is quote unquote faith promoting about the scandal, then little will be said about the scandal. Uh, am I getting that wrong? Uh, this is, I'm only speculating here, but uh, uh, what do you think? That sounds right. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, I could I could only speculate. Um, also, I mean, I would have said what Al said is that you know what it, it's such a you know it's such a heartbreaking story, and I, I could also have seen 
a desire to want to wait, not get out in front of what the church itself was saying about the issue, but perhaps wait to take stock of it uh, later on. But I agree with what you said. I mean, it's not, there's nothing faith promoting about the story in a classic sense, yeah, right? I, I mean, exactly. I think one, one, I am sure just as faithful Catholics, faithful Presbyterians, faithful people of any, any organization have discussed, you know, um, sorrowful things and missteps. Um, there are certainly ways that faithful Latter Day Saints could discuss this in a way that didn't violate those sort of precepts that that one of you referenced. Yeah, uh, what, it's kind of hard to expect an organization to air its own dirty laundry uh, on a uh, a faith promoting podcast. Yeah, so if I'm if I'm getting any of that wrong, I'm just speculating. I understand that. Then um, I invite Jeff uh, from the This Week in Mormons to come on our podcast. Love to clear up the record. And speaking of which, the Cultural Hall is a quote unquote faithful podcast, and I listened to their episode last week, and they did spend most of the podcast on the story. And what's interesting for me is I read the uh, Cultural Halls, what their target audience is for their uh, podcast. Al, can you uh, what what is their target audience? It's a very uh, diverse group of people. Yeah, th this is their uh, expressed uh, target audience is the Mormon slash LDS slash member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Liars Day Saints. All are welcome here. Yeah, three very diverse <laughs> groups of people. <laughs> Mormons, Latter-day Saints, and members of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. All are welcome here. I, I never thought I'd say this, but I think even BYU is more diverse. <laughs> yeah, I mean, yeah. the Cultural Hall, they also in their, their description says, we are a weekly show that is willing to talk about mm -hmm. anything from a believer standpoint. Mm -hmm. Believer standpoint. What what do you hear when you say, if a podcast says we're only going to discuss things from a believer standpoint, what do you hear when, when, when you hear that? Uh, what, what do you think, John? Well, I mean, it may, maybe it's, it, you know, I'm not going to speculate because I'm not overly familiar with um, – the other podcasts that you're talking about, but I think it's it's sort of it's perhaps implying that certain standpoints fall within, you know, the the acceptable spectrum of belief, and you know, other other standpoints might not. So it might might imply that there's a narrower range of faithful standpoints than there actually okay. might be. Yeah, I, I think it implies um, that say uh, there's a safe space there. Uh, for the believing uh, Latter Day Saint, where they're going to get um, uh, news and uh, let's see, um, the kind of rhetoric that is not going to challenge their faith, or uh, they're going to be disturbed by it. Yeah, I mean, I, I just think about what is the. I, I've noticed that with a lot of other podcasts, you will see the believer standpoint there quite a bit, and that was not something I, f I was familiar with before I got into podcasting. I mean, if we, if we, I personally don't see the point of just saying I'm, I'm we're going to discuss things from a believer standpoint, or we're going to discuss things from a belie non-believer standpoint, or we're going to discuss things from an agnostic standpoint. I just like to talk about things and let the best ideas rise. I don't like to predetermine the outcomes before we get going. I mean, if we think about politics, if we start a discussion of politics with the end state of mind that, hey, uh, the Republican Party or the Green Party is the best party and God's one and only true party. I don't think that uh, any, politi any political dialogue that starts with that end state in mind is going to accomplish much. And I do want to take this back to Joseph Smith. Think back to Joseph Smith. When he was searching for the truth as a young man, he didn't narrow himself to one school of thinking. You remember, he said he was partial to the Methodist sect, but some of his family, including his mother, joined the Presbyterians. They're in good company, right, John? Mm -hmm. Uh, they are, but you know, you know, the canonical history does not come down very favorably on my Presbyterians. That's true. Um, it is I, a, yeah, I have a thick skin. I can take it. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad you do, because <laughs> yeah. he he said some very unfavorable things. Joseph Smith did. <laughs> uh, yeah, so I, yeah, we we don't have time to get into those, but I mean, he did. He patronized a variety of different preachers mm -hmm. and churches. And so Joseph Smith Sr. was a universalist. He engaged in a wide scope mm -hmm. of religious thought. Now, yeah. if he had just stayed with a narrow believers-only standpoint mentality, he never would have formed a transformative religion. So, I mean, if Joseph Smith had been alive when podcasting were around, and he only listened to quote unquote orthodox podcast of the day, there'd be no restoration. You know what I mean? Sure. 
So uh, anyway, if I get any of that wrong, I invite the cultural hauler this week in Mormons to come on this podcasting world. Uh, this uh, the Mormon news podcasting world is super tiny, so uh, we would love to reach out to them. I have emailed all of them: the Mormon news round, uh, the Mormon news report this week in Mormons, and the cultural hall. Haven't heard back from them, but uh, I'm not gonna I'm gonna, I'm not gonna stop trying. Now, our first uh, news article of the week here. Now, this is all that was all preamble. We're jumping into the first news article, and this is a big article. When this first came across, this is Mormon Church avoids tax. Uh, Mormon Church avoids tax on huge Israeli tax gains, and this is from the Globes, and it was published on the 15th of August by Shay Aspro. When I came across this, I didn't think it was necessarily newsworthy until I read through the whole thing, and it is really eye opening. So let me give you a quick summary of what's in here. Uh, inside of Enzyme Peak, which is the church's investment arm, which is uh, somewhere in the realm of about $150 billion, according to the Widow's Might report. Inside of that, you have what is called Marshfield Advisors. It's one uh, it's one unit of the Enzyme Peak Advisors, um, and it has a tax exemption in the U.S. and has avoided taxes in Israel, too. So what Enzyme Peak does is they invest the church's uh, surplus money, basically, through 15 subsidiary companies, two of which do venture capitalism, which is not something I was aware of. I mean, I, I guess I could have been ignorant. Uh, but one of these uh, LDS church companies, Marshfield, invested $70 million in the Israeli tech company, Iron Source. Now, Iron Source now is worth $4.4 billion. So the church owns like 3% of it, of Iron Source. And they made over $100 million on the investment. Now, the church is not wanting to pay any taxes, both in the United States and in Israel, because those are capital gains taxes, right? So that's the question I have for both of you. Should the church be paying those capital gains taxes on those profits, which would be tens of millions of dollars? I have to say yes. Uh, what, what about you, John? What do you think? I mean, I have, I mean, I read the article. I'm just going to say that international tax law is way above my pay grade. Um, you know, I think maybe, maybe what you're really getting at is in general, should ensign peak be tax exempt i mean if but i mean if they have if they have to pay the tax under israeli law then i'm sure in the end of the day they're going to pay the tax um I, you know i mean i i have to say that the you know when the ensign peak story broke several years ago i mean i don't i don't feel outraged a lot about a lot of things and i didn't feel outraged about it i mean i think in general tax exempt laws in the u.s are super liberal you know, all sorts of groups maintain tax exempt status for things that I don't particularly think need to be tax exempt. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I wouldn't generally be happier if the U.S. government had an extra $25 billion as opposed to the LDS church. So, mm -hmm. <laughs> but yeah. I, I, you know, the real answer to your question, I'd have to leave to the tax experts. Mm -hmm. I, I guess my uh, opinion with uh, regards to tax exempt status with um, with churches is, you know, uh, I think they ought to be kind of the same on uh, as it is on uh, like uh, w with your average citizen that um, if you can prove that you're using uh, the money that's being brought in for charitable purposes or to benefit the community, then absolutely, you know, uh, let's uh, let's make it exempt from taxes. But if you can't prove that that money that's being brought in um, is going to charitable uh, purposes, then, you know, why should anybody be exempt from from taxes? Is my opinion. Right. I mean, uh, Ensign Peak is a 5013C. So the per, you know, when you have a 5013C, you're allowed to be tax exempt be, uh, under certain circumstances. For and especially with churches and the LDS Church in particular and Ensign Peak, it says that we're going to be doing charitable or educational or humanitarian or other uh, things. That's the reason that we are allowed to be tax exempt is because we have a purpose and a mission. And what the uh, whistleblower leak with Lars Nielsen said is that the Ensign Peak is not doing those things which are in accordance with its own charter. That's why it shouldn't be tax exempt. So, I mean, this this reveals to me, this particular article reveals the genius of Ensign Peak, which I didn't realize before. It's when Warren Buffett or Mark Cuban or Silicon Valley uh, venture capitalism or, or even Mitt Romney when he was at Bain Capital, for instance, when they mm -hmm. invest in a company, they all pay capital gains taxes on those profits. But the LDS mm -hmm. Church, they do venture capitalism and they're exempt. So they don't have to. And they've got to be one of the only venture capitalists in the United States. I'm not an expert on this. I get that. Who doesn't have to pay those taxes on those capital gains. And so it's like an unfair playing field. It is. But I imagine that other 
you know, I, I understand what Al's saying about the lack of disbursements. Just in terms of the unfair playing field, though, I mean, other religious institutions do this just on a smaller scale. And it's not as mm -hmm. if the information has not been handed over to the IRS. And in general, you know, the IRS, I think, is fairly leery to go after religious groups on tax exempt status. And I certainly haven't heard any rumblings that the IRS is preparing to, you know, take legal action against the church. I'd be very surprised if it did in the end. Mm -hmm. Agreed. Agreed. You know, uh, the, the biggest takeaway from this, from this particular article for me was Lars Nielsen quoted the uh, Enzyme Peaks, uh, 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 the chief advisement manager, uh, Roger, um, oh, sorry, I forgot his last name, but he told him on one occasion that the biggest danger for Enzyme is to lose the tax exemption. Because when you have a fund that has $150 billion in it, if that fund is not tax exempt, it's going to get a lot less. So that's the biggest danger for the church. And uh, I just thought it was a very interesting article, really opens up the uh, information about Enzyme Peak. The last thing I want to say is those 15 subsidiary companies inside of Enzyme Peak, each one of them has a specific goal in mind, and they're all si siloed so that they don't necessarily see what each other is doing. Lars Nielsen, he managed the $880 million. Uh, I can't remember which exactly he was in, but those 15 companies, one of them does commercial real estate investment. One, A couple of them do venture capitalism. One of them is in U.S. bonds, uh, U.S. stocks. Another is in international stocks. Another one's in bonds. They're all you know, so another one's in securities, another one's in, uh, you know, insurance, whatever it is, they're all have their own particular, uh, they have their own, all have their own particular focus. So uh, we're learning more and more about Enzyme Peak, and, and I find it to be fascinating. Hopefully our listeners do as well. A anything else yeah. on this article, uh, gentlemen, before we go on to the second article? No, it was a big one, though. <clears throat> yeah. This podcast is brought to you by our friends over at Signature Books, www.signaturebooks.com. We invite you to check out their latest book written by Romney Burke, which is entitled Susie Young Gates, Daughter of Mormonism. Brigham Young had over 50 wives and 56 children, but none has better name recognition than daughter Susie Young Gates. She lived from 1856 and died in 1933. Yet she, like so many women of Mormonism's past, has remained a mystery to most church members. In Susie Young Gates, Romney Burke, the author, paints a portrait of a strong woman who rose to prominence within the church, fought for the rights of women throughout the country, yet dealt with personal trials and her share of heartbreak. All right, so uh, next one, we're going to jump over to the Salt Lake Tribune uh, by David Noyes, August 16th. Or sorry, eight, August eighteenth, twenty twenty-two. Um, the latest from Mormon Land Church may have to up its ante to sell the Boy Scout abuse cases. So, um, yeah, what we found is that the um, the judge in the case, where with the you know, we talked last week about the church is trying to uh, get the two hundred and fifty million that it pledged to cover the whole uh, settlement that they would never have to pay anything more, including if there was other cases that arose. And the judge threw that out and said, no, um, you're going to have to, we're going to have to do better than that. Um, which it seems like the church tried to get out ahead of it. I was a little surprised when the church went as early as it did um, in this case, because I think that this case um, was what, maybe six months old at this point that uh, they broke and the church came right out and said, okay, 250 million. That's what we're putting on the table. We're going to, we're going to do that offer. And, you know, a lot of people applauded it and said, wow, you know, this is, in fact, I think we, when we reported on uh, this podcast, we applied it and said, Hey, good for the church for uh, being willing to come out and uh, pay what's owed. But the, it seems like the judges said there may be more owed than just 250 million. Um, and that doesn't necessarily include all the uh, insurance uh, that would have to pay out as well. Um, but yeah, this is <laughs> this is kind of a big uh, article itself there. Um, that so far there's at least um, you know uh, eighty thousand plus victims that they're aware of. So this is a big one. Yeah. So the church pledged that two hundred and fifty million dollar payment plus insurance. So the church's total uh, 
pledged to these victims was somewhere in the neighborhood of a billion dollars. The total settlement is about $2.3 billion. Well, what this judge is saying from my reading of it, it says the Boy Scouts of America has declared bankruptcy. Well, part of the, their declaring bankruptcy is they said, well, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints is going to give us $250 million plus some insurance money to help settle these abuses. Well, the judge in this case is saying, well, Boy Scouts of America, we're not going to let you have your bankruptcy because we don't think that the $250 million that the church has pledged is going to be enough. And so mm -hmm. the church is maybe has to come back to the table and say, we're going to bring some more. So maybe the church, when these when it very first came out, came up with a low ball offer of $250 million, hoping that that mm -hmm. would go through. Uh, and it looks like it very well could be more. Uh, any thoughts on this article, John? Well, I don't have any. I mean, in general, this is, yeah, I mean, the, the whole case is a heartbreaking subject, right? I mean, you start talking about statistics of, you know, 1,125 abuse victims for $250 million. Obviously, judges can put a price tag on that kind of thing. Um, you know, I I can't say that each of those claims should be 30,000 or 60,000 or 100,000. Uh, each, each one of them, um, you know, at least potentially represents, you know, a truly heartbreaking situation. And, you know, I don't know what constitutes doing right in that situation, except a heartfelt apology and doing as much as you know you can sort of reasonably do to to make amends yeah and what's interesting also that this article points out is that the group of boy scout america insurers are also going to appeal the sexual abuse settlement so the insurers which is some of the biggest insurers in the country we're talking about a these are the insurers that backstop the methodist church the latter uh, lds church and some of these other churches and other um I don't know, all the Boy Scout troops out there, they had insurers. And so those insurers now are also uh, kicking at the pricks and saying, well, we don't want to come up with the amount of money that uh, we don't want to get to the $2.3 billion settlement. So the church is maybe not having 250 might not be enough. The insurers are balking. I mean, this thing is going to take a long time to get through. And some of these mm -hmm. abuse victims, I mean, have been waiting for decades. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, and what, what's unusual about this is the Boy Scouts of America also agreed to pay the sex abuse victims without regard to the state statute of limitations. Some states mm -hmm. for have a statute of limitations on this uh, child sex abuse. Usually they're somewhat generous. They could be 20, 30 years. But some of them uh, some of them uh, have that. I'm sorry, I'm not being very lucid, but some of them are some of these states have laws on the books that say that a settlement like this can't work if it's more than 30 years old. Some of these states now are coming and saying, well, we need to pass legislation that is going to make it so that we can receive the full amount of the settlement when it finally goes through. So, yeah. I mean, this is this is a big, big case that is going to take a really long time. It's going to be really messy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, when it first broke, I never thought uh, we'd be sitting here saying a few months later that, uh, yeah, uh, the church actually lowballed an offer with $250 million. Wow, but uh, so, sounds like, I mean, a quarter of a billion dollars, that's a huge payout. But that's also a huge pool of victims when you're talking about 80,000 plus victims. And, you know, John's right. There's various uh, degrees of severity. I mean, some kids, uh, they just, you know, had a, 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 a scout leader that uh, t asked them to take their pants down in front of them. Um, others were, you know, brutalized over a long period of time. And so uh, the the court is going to look at each of these cases and then award uh, penalties accordingly. So, yeah, our heart, our hearts go out to the victims uh, for everyone who's involved with this. And uh, yeah. you know, we, we, we hope that this will be uh, speedily resolved and that um, mm -hmm. anyone who was uh, affected negatively in this capacity will receive the proper um, uh, compensation um, uh, that they deserve. Absolutely. You know, and that does take us into our featured news article of the week, which is uh, on somewhat of a related uh, topic, which is uh, we had the Boy Scout sex abuse uh, settlement. And now we also have the AP story, which we're still having the fallout from the story. I mean, it brings us no delight to continue to talk about this. We, we cover on this podcast wherever the news takes us. That's where the news takes us. And the news is still really hot on this item. I mean, it's still really, really uh, it's a hot story, yeah. for people, even several weeks later. 
yeah, the, this is still the the big uh, the big item this week. And I think last week we reported on the church's um, second response to it, um, which was a rather weak response. And uh, this week it's still big news. So yeah, uh, this uh, is go ahead, their, <laughs> yeah August seventeenth, twenty twenty two, from the church's official news source, the the uh, the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints on newsroom dot dot org. It says the church provides further details about the Arizona abuse case. So the church outlines its feelings on abuse and how the recent recent Associated Press story got it wrong. And they're outlining uh, with bullet points and numbers. Uh, it's, it's a very, I, I want to say somewhat of a legalistic response. Uh, how, uh, did you guys read this response? Or what did you feel? How, how did you feel about the church's re- This is their second uh, bite at the apple on trying to clear up the record on what they feel that the AP story did not get the proper facts. Um, w- once again, the church is saying that without... Um getting into any specifics um it's very much a legal um uh proclamation or legal uh release um just saying that the church is not at fault here but um nothing further no specifics so i'll just ask you two a question about this because i'm sure you've followed it even more closely than i have though i you know i've certainly read the news i mean the the churches so on the one hand just on the legal issue the church probably did not have a did not necessarily have a legal obligation to report in 2012. Like it's sort of a gray area in Arizona whether or not you know clergy confidentiality would have applied. It but, says in Arizona that you that uh, you're not a, rep- a mandated reporter in Arizona. Not a mandated reporter. Right. So, uh, there's you know, no it's, mandate. Right. So at the time. Um, you know, the, the decision was not to report to, but to, you know, pursue other avenues. All right. So I think maybe, maybe what people are looking for is a fuller explanation from the church's perspective of why that decision was made at the time. And with the benefit of hindsight, whether or not it's defensible, am I, is that correct? I think you're. I think you hit the nail on the head. Yeah, uh, from what I've seen thus far from the church, uh, their justification seems to be that we would like to offer um, the sinner the opportunity at repentance. Um, mm-hmm. So, if a uh, confession is made uh, to a clergy member, then they would like to yeah. to help the the person who the perpetrator um, to overcome their their sin right. and go through a repentance process. Yeah. And they yeah, didn't I mean, necessarily, and they, they would perhaps say they didn't fully mm-hmm. understand the mm-hmm. extent and horror of the, um, sure. the yeah. crime at the time. Yeah. Yeah. Um, what the church, uh, first of all, you're right. The Arizona is not a mandated reporter state. So the church was, uh, when the bishops, both bishops called the church helpline and referred to out to the lawyers, uh, the lawyers uh, told them that you do not have to report this. So the church has done everything that is legally, that they're legally required to do. So they followed mm-hmm. the law. Okay. And, and, and nobody is disputing that really. Uh, but, but, this is the this is the issue with the statement. The, uh, the, tr- the statement claims that there were significant flaws in the AP story, but it admits, number one, that the bishop knew that the father abused his child at least once in 2011 mm-hmm. and that, this bit, that the abuse was significant enough that the church excommunicated the father in 2013. The bishop called the helpline but did not report the abuse because the father did not give him the permission to report it because it was during a priest penitent privilege. Mm-hmm. And then the abuse finally continued until 2017 when it was finally reported by someone else. So, I mean, we're talking about six yeah. years of abuse with multiple victims posting it on the internet. Yeah. Uh, just uh, your heart breaks over this. It's just, yeah. You know, how does this happen? What, what people are also pointing out also is that the statement that the church made, it said in, in this particular statement, this is the second bite at the apple. The church is saying, quote, in late 2011, Paul Adams made a limited confession to his bishop about a single incident of past abuse. But when you go back and look at the documents that the AP 
revealed. You have a question and answer session. Uh, it, it, you have a question and answer session where it said, quote, during the counseling session, Paul Adams explained to the Bishop Herod and that Paul Adams was visually and taking visuals of uh, oral stimulation. And he said that he had taken video and that he'd done it numerous times. So the church's statement seems to seems to want to make it limited, like it was only a single incident. But the AP documents meet, make it seem like it happened many times over a course of years. And people are wondering about that. Mm hmm. So uh, this explanation is not getting you know, is is not necessarily it's bringing up more questions than necessarily answers. Yeah, I mean, I could also you know I would also ask this, and maybe maybe you know I don't have any legal insight into this, but I could. I I, may, I think it's not the most effective PR, obviously, but mm -hmm. I imagine that there's a, perhaps a decision to be a little bit circumspect and a little bit guarded in light of you know how this might play out legally you know maybe that maybe that makes it more difficult or makes it feel more difficult to come out and say you know we made we didn't make the right call yeah uh, hindsight's always twenty twenty, right so i mean that's kind of the thing is looking back um I guess that um, the, what the court has to determine is, is this something where, I mean, rather than looking back at what we know now uh, compared to what was known then, would we have the expectation that if people knew what they knew at the time to make the, um, the same uh, decisions or same choices that we would make now looking back on it, knowing all of it? Because, uh, of course, anybody looking back with that kind of uh, insight and no the knowledge of what happened and what led to um, would put a stop to it up front. But, um, you know, that, that's us looking back. Now, the bishop at the time, did he have that much uh, understanding? If he did, then, yeah, he certainly had that uh, responsibility to take action. But in 2011 how would he know that uh, this guy was going to continue to perpetrate on uh, his first daughter and then also perpetrate on the second daughter that hadn't even been born yet yeah. Yeah. I, mean, I mean if i think back to the bible think of the parable of the good samaritan i mean the, you think about the priest and the levite now technically they weren't obligated to help the victim you know and they didn't consult no. any lawyers yeah. Before, you know, they didn't there wasn't a, consul, a consultation when the Samaritan was helping the uh, wounded man. You know, just think about the, how, how Jesus would approach this. I don't think that Jesus yeah. in this parable would have people call uh, a lawyer helpline. And I don't think that the uh, priest and the Levite should be considering whether um, there was a legal obligation for them to help someone. That's a good sure. point. Yeah. And that's, yeah. it's a good application of the parable. Uh, do you mind if I share a couple of tangential thoughts Please. on the issue? You know, I. Um, you know, when, when I read about, when, whenever I read about these cases, not just in the LDS context, but whether it's the Catholic church, I mean, I think about, um, you know, a couple of things in, you know, my own life and in my own religious contexts, I was surprised, I don't know, maybe it was six or seven years ago, my wife and I volunteered at our church just to sort of help out with um, an elementary age children's program. And, you know, we had to attend a presentation by uh, a lawyer connected with the church on issues pertaining to abuse. Uh, we had to undergo background checks. And we have policies in place that, you know, prohibit um, youth leaders from, say, giving a child. Um, a ride home, um, you know, without another adult being present. Yeah. Um, so there, there, you know, there are a lot of safeguards in place. And you know, it, it, my first reaction was, this is kind of over the top. And you know, when I was a when I was a kid, you know, I was in Boy Scouts. I was a terrible Boy Scout, but I was in Boy Scouts. And you know, I had a lot of religious leaders, you know, just reach out to me and mentor me and do things with me play tennis with me, go for a motorcycle ride, take me out for ice cream. Mm -hmm. And, you know, you'd give up some of that if you put yeah. more safeguards in place, I suppose. Mm -hmm. But 
you know, given what a pervasive issue this is in human societies, you know, child, um, child sexual abuse, you need those safeguards. So, you know, beyond the, you know, current, um, you know, beyond the current AP story, you know, I think the, I think the LDS church and lots of other congregations, denominations across the country, it's just another wake up call to take a really hard look at whether or not, you know, we're doing everything reasonable to protect kids from being in terrible situations that we usually don't imagine until we read about in, um, you know, in a story like this. Yeah, I really appreciate that, John. And as we've discussed before, the church only does background checks on, on leaders in states or nations in which it is required by law. If your state does not require a background check for leaders, then the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints will conduct no background check. And that has led to a number of problems in the past. Yeah, um, and there certainly isn't uh, any kind of instruction. I, I think that there needs to be instruction, um, just like uh, John went through uh, when you're volunteering with the youth uh, to understand that hey, these are these are safeguard measures that are there to protect uh, you, there protect the church, there protect the kids uh, above everybody else. So. Now, yeah. bishops, uh, Al and uh, John, that they, they do a, I think it's once every three year training on, uh, it's an online module that they do on preventing child abuse and how to respond to it. But mm -hmm. my understanding from the word on the street is that it's not strictly enforced and it's probably inadequate. Yeah. So, uh, you know, this scandal is also leading to vandalism of LDS meeting houses in your neck of the woods there uh, in Utah, right, Al? Mm -hmm. you, you saw that, right? It, it wasn't me. Oh, okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah, right. But yeah, I, I did see the articles uh, where this is. Um, yeah, there's uh, been spray paint on the uh, local meeting houses, uh, especially down in the Salt Lake area, wow. where, uh, yeah, um, I, I think people are upset by the uh, the Associated Press article, and so they're lashing out against the church um, by spray painting the buildings. Um, not to say, and, you know, I, I don't know one way or another, um, but uh, there's no there's not been anybody that's actually come forward and said, Hey, I'm spray painting this church because, uh, I suffered abuse at the hands of a, a church leader in here. Nobody said that. So, um, yeah, I think it's just people lashing out against the church, um, just because it's frustrating and nobody likes to hear about kids getting hurt. No, uh, what they're spray painting though, is very telling. They're saying sexual predators and mm -hmm. help the helpless and save our kids. They're spray painting that there's yeah. been like six or 10 buildings that have been broken into vandalized. And it seems to be in direct response to this particular article. Yeah. Uh, that's what the police are saying it anyway. They're saying it's quite plausible. So it's a graffiti found in Sandy and some of the other things. Um, so it is, it's really affecting people. In fact, they had a, uh, a rally here back in Utah at the state capitol on August 19th. Group gathers to rally against Utah's clergy reporting exemption because in Utah, again, you have the priest penitent privilege. Utah bishops are not mandatory reporters of child abuse. And they're saying, hey, we want to change that. And about 300 people gathered on Friday to the Utah capitol calling for that to be changed. Yes, they did. Um, you know, and uh, hopefully something will happen with it. Um, you know, this is, this is how change uh, takes place is people get upset to go and enough to go and, uh, and make their voice heard and they go and uh, do these uh, demonstrations. And so, you know, I think that their, their hearts are in the right place. Um, I don't know if it'll happen, but we'll see what happens in this, in the beehive state here. Now, I believe that uh, Governor Cox, the governor of Utah, said that he would sign a bill if it was placed on his desk requiring clergy to report. I can't find that in an article, but I, I, I read that somewhere. I don't know if that is 100 uh, percent true. Uh, but, but, John, let me ask you this question. When it comes to handling child sex abuse, what can the LDS Church learn from the Catholic Church's pre-sexual abuse scandal, uh, You know, especially, specifically the one that was back in 2012 that was reported in, in, by the Boston Globe in that Boston diocese? Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. I mean, I think, yeah, I mean, I think, first of all, when that story broke, I think it, you know, it was easy for me at the time to think, well, it's always easy to say, you know, thank God I'm not like that man, right? Or thank God our church isn't like that church. Yeah, the reality is this is an issue. This was an issue in all churches. I don't mean every individual congregation necessarily, but 
you know, I, I think, I think also that, you know, all churches perhaps could one takeaway from that is that if you don't really lean into both transparency and appropriate repentance, it's a very faith shattering, um, it's a very faith shattering news, I guess I'd say, not just for yeah. the victims, but for other um, congregants or members. And, yeah. you know, it's, you know, and uh, it's a little bit different in the sense of with the Catholic Church, um, you know, it's just a long, drawn out process of diocese, di di diocese around the world and sort of drip by drip and, you know, still stories about, you know, um, bishops or cardinals that, you know, may have turned a blind eye to things in the past. It's very hard to thoroughly clean house on this issue. Um, so I don't know. Those are not terribly lucid thoughts. Yeah, but I, I think you're right. Nobody wants to uh, feel like they're going to a church that um, doesn't have those safeguards in place, or doesn't, uh, or, or, or uh, what, nobody wants to feel like they're going to a church where that could happen. You know? Right. Yeah. Yeah, and the reality is, it it, it could, in theory, happen anywhere. Anywhere. That's exactly. why why it's so scary. And you can talk about safeguards, and you couldn't come up with absolutely perfect safeguards, right? No, exactly. Um, and, um, you know, I, I mean, I think, I think that's, you, you, churches have to be, I think, just very, very proactive going forward. And, and John, and, and Al, I think that people know that obviously that you can't, there's nothing you can do to prevent some of these uh, situations from happening. There's no amount of background checks. There's no amount of not leaving people alone that will get absolutely everyone because it, sometimes it can only just take a few seconds of being in a hallway where something something horrible could happen. So I think what really um, upsets people is they understand that there's always a possibility that something horrific could happen, but it's the response right. when that tragedy takes place. They say, okay, something, something horrible has happened. Now I expect that my church leaders are going to take swift right. and decisive and morally ethical uh, behavior to hold perpetrators to account, to help the loved ones and to make rep recompense and to apologize, to repent and ensure that this type, type of thing doesn't happen. And, and talking about the uh, Catholic uh, sexual abuse where they, you know, shuffled the priests around from diocese to diocese and, and didn't report it. And if you look at this article where the church, they called the helpline and they said, don't report it to police. That's where it right. really ignites a fire in people's uh, bellies that says, yeah. okay, uh, th that's unacceptable. Yeah, because what, what if it had been my kid is what people think, right? right? Yeah. Of course, absolutely. Which is, you know, honestly, that's exactly how people should yeah. react. I don't just mean in this case. Mm -hmm. And, you know, just if you think of, you know, almost the favorite Bible verse in the U.S. in the last two centuries was Jesus saying, let the little children come to me. I got a friend who did a study of Bible verses in American newspapers, and that was number one almost all the time. And the Book of Mormon has an amplification of it, you know, of Jesus proactively, you know, welcoming children to him, uh, which is such a nice image uh, for a church. And so, you know, there, I, there very much is a sacred responsibility to you know, to shelter and protect children. Yeah, and uh, the Deseret News um, actually dropped an article as well about this week that says that sex abuse cases uh, often focus uh, on um, the, the the clergy reporting of the sex abuse of the penitent privilege. Uh, and they did a breakdown of the entire United States and said, how many of the states have, are, is it required to report? How many of them is it optional? And then the, how many of them you don't report? which uh, uh, taking the church at its word here, according to the article, all 50 states in the United States have some kind of clerch penitent privilege, uh, privilege codified into law. Now, in those laws, seven states, only seven, make it mandatory for clergy to report child sex abuse, even when it is learned only through a religious confession. So this, according to the Desert News, se only seven is mandata mandated reporters, which I found to be quite shocking. And a total of 24 other states list clergy as mandatory reporters, but 
provided priests penitent privilege shielding confessions from reporters, and then other 19 states do not list clergy as mandatory reporters at all. That's basically optional. So, I mean, we're seeing a wide variety of different laws that are on the books that uh, these uh, Latter-day Saint bishops have to navigate. I just thought that more states would make it mandatory. I, I guess I was just a little bit surprised. Yeah, for sure. It is surprising uh, that you find that only seven of them uh, out of 50. That's a surprising number. Yeah, it is. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I think part of that is is just that I'd say still respect for, um, you know, the Catholic sacrament of confession mm -hmm. and just how, you know, strong, you know, historically, you know, that, that has been, um, you know, that, you know, I think in some of the articles that you might point people to that, you know, priests who break the seal of the confession could be themselves excommunicated. Obviously that wouldn't be if they were in a, in a mandatory reporting situation. Mm -hmm. But, you know, that tradition is just so strong that I think it, you know, it, it sort of found, um, found a place in those laws. Yeah. Right. And, and that's, that's a good point, John. I, I also think about is what is legal. Is that the, is that the bar for what is moral is, is the basic legal requirement. Is that where we're going to base our morality on And just a little thought experiment along those lines. Mm -hmm. If it was moral, not to report the abuse in Arizona, because remember, Arizona is not a manda mandatory reporting state. Then mm -hmm. is it also moral for uh, a gay person to marry another gay person because it's legal? Or is it moral to drink and smoke because they're legal or, or where abortions are legal? That's also moral. So, I mean, what point. is our standard of morality? Is it just based upon what the lawmakers in the state say or or should as a religious, you know, as religions, should we have a higher sense of morality of what is actually right? I think about the church's Sunday school manual. Uh, I pulled out this quote, quote, the laws of men deviate further and further from the laws of God. And we should also always hold fast to the laws of God, end quote. Um, so, you know, people are saying that the church should simply get rid of the helpline phone number and replace it with another number, 911. I mean, what, what is the legal and moral? What, is there a difference here or? Well, I mean, it's been said time and time again that uh, the laws of God are um, higher than the laws of men. So I would expect us to, I would expect churches to hold a higher standard for sure. Yeah, I mean, think back to John Taylor when it came to polygamy. He said that uh, polygamy would be an eternal covenant, and we'll be ranged under the banner of heaven uh, and, and and follow God's law. The laws of men mean nothing uh, for those early church polygamists. Now, why? If the That's laws where of the, the title came from, from. right? <laughs> if the laws, if the laws for early church leaders and polygamy, especially in the Utah period and in between the periods of uh, 1850 to 1890, if those laws meant absolutely nothing, then why are we holding to whatever happens to be the local laws at a state level? Why are we now appealing to that and saying that that is our standard? Okay, so I just see yeah. a dichotomy there. I mean, I would say in a way that if. Uh, yeah, you know, I mean, you know, I, I think in the article that you referenced, there was some doubt raised as to whether enacting mandatory reporting laws would actually result in more reporting, because if abusers knew that they could not confess, you know, without a certainty of being reported, they probably wouldn't, fewer mm -hmm. would confess. So yeah. we don't necessarily know that those laws would, in the end, um, reduce abuse. Um, however, but we know if, it would re reduce reporting, right? Yeah. Well, but, but if reporting were mandatory, then in a sense, it would make the decision-making process much yeah. less fraught for <clears throat> religious communities because, <laughs> you know, I, I think on a human level, no matter how bad a crime might sound, if you have an individual who comes and seems extremely penitent and repentant and has every intention of not doing this again, you can see why, you know, friends, religious leaders, they're not going to want to report. So I think the legal obligation needs to be really clear so that communities aren't faced with, with making those decisions. Um, yeah, that, that makes sense. When I mean, when you got uh, these people, they're approaching a confidant, uh, someone who's close to them. 
the clergy member, you know, or, you know, uh, spouse, uh, uh, friend, family member. Sure. Um, it's, you know, people are looking for a safe place to, to, you know, get this off their chest. And that, you know, that's why confession is a sacrament to the Catholic church. Uh, you know, it allows you to alle- alleviate that burden. Um, yeah. <clears throat> yeah. And you're right. If the, if it's, this is just like a, a one-time thing where, you know, you know, I, 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 I did something that I'm not proud of. I did something that I'm ashamed of. I did something terrible, um, you know, but I, you know, promise to never do it again, then maybe you can work to make that right with the victim at, uh, on a personal level. But yeah, I mean, it, I, it, it's a difficult case for sure. This one. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, 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 re- I-, I realized that everything I was saying about safeguards and so forth, uh, yeah, they don't necessarily, apl- you know, they don't really apply to this case. It was within a family. Not necessarily. Uh, no. But, you know, it just always gets me thinking about the broader <clears throat> issue of, you know, yeah. How many children end up in vulnerable situations? Unfortunately, mm-hmm. as this case shows, often within their own families, which is that's even more heartbreaking. I can't Sad- imagine. Can't yeah. imagine enduring that sort of of evil. Mm-hmm. Yeah, sadly, it's very true that uh, there that oftentimes you find that families are some of the worst um, enablers for this kind of abuse. Yeah. 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 Yeah, that's unfortunate. And this uh, this privilege defense, the uh, the the so called priest penitent privilege, that uh, is going to be more in the spotlight. Uh, I mean, the judge is limiting the privilege defense in this Arizona Mormon sex abuse scandal, right, Al? Yes, he is. We're jumping over to the Washington Post for this one. Uh, Michael Resendez, I believe he's the same guy that uh, first broke uh, with the Associated Press. First broke it August eighteenth of this year. Yeah, the judge limits privilege defense in Arizona. Mormon sex abuse case, where the Arizona judge who's hearing this case said, uh, no, the church does not get to hide behind the uh, the priest penitent privilege uh, the, or the clergy penitent privilege. They're going to have to turn over all of the information. So if there's you know documents, notes, uh, phone calls, or whatever, it's going to have to be turned over. Um, because, uh, let's see, uh, Judge Laura Cardinal is the one who's running this one. And, uh, yeah, she uh, ruled on August 8th that um, Paul Adams waived his right to keep his confession secret when he posted the videos of himself sexually abusing his two daughters on the Internet and boasted of the abuse on social media and confessed to federal law enforcement agents who arrested him in 2017 with no help from the church. So the judge is not impressed with the church's actions um, with this case, the judge is uh, intent on seeing that the law uh, gets everything that uh, the law needs in order to exact justice for the victim. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> the, the judge is saying that his acts can only be characterized as a waiver of the clergy penitent privilege. So the crazy, the, the worst thing about this entire story now, now that he doesn't even get the uh, the clergy penitent privilege is that the bishops could have reported this from the beginning and stopped it anyway because he doesn't even get penitent privilege to begin with yeah, you know, yeah that's there's, no pen- there's no penitence when you're online posting uh the abuse of your kids in video format and uh boasting about it <laughs> yep i mean obviously no one wants an lds bishop to go to jail or have to be forced to break the law or uh for you know uh, be fined or uh to have to you know possibly be personally named in a lawsuit because they didn't follow whatever the local statutes are you know to you know have you know their their home pot or their farm or whatever it is possibly seized from them as a, a as a fine for breaking a, a priest penitent privilege i mean this is just so complex uh, it's just it's just a horrible horrible mess. We outlined yeah. uh, in the last episode that uh, John we outlined a, a a system that we thought that the church could uh, enact to uh, fix this without tinkering with uh, priest penitent privilege without mm-hmm. tinkering with laws. To our listeners out there, if you're only listening to this episode, go back to our last episode because we outlined a, a plan to fix this entire thing, which we're not going to go through this time because we did go through that last week. But uh, we think that there's a way out, right, Al? Yeah, you know, and you know, basically to sum up, <clears throat> the, the church has the resources, it has the real estate, it has the the funds to be able to provide um, counseling and um, you know mental health and uh, psychological help for the victims and uh, for the penitent as well. Uh, you know, if you got somebody that's confessing to the bishop, keep the priest penitent privilege in in uh, in effect, and you know, get some help for that uh, perpetrator. So, yeah. 
Yeah, there, there's now, options. It was a, it was a really good plan. Uh, Dives, I have to say, is I have to give him the credit. He's the one that orchestrated it, and it it makes sense. You know, I did talk to a lawyer. Uh, I talked to RFM, the Radio Free Mormon, who is a lawyer. Mm-hmm. He's a famous podcaster, John. I talked to him about this particular case for about an hour, and and those were the ideas for that germinated from. Uh, we don't have time to go through that today, but uh, for our listeners out there, go back and listen to that. By the way, you can find us on Facebook. You can find us on Twitter. Drop us a like. Drop us a comment. Drop us a, drop us a subscription. Now, this next article here, article number five, we have two articles left to go, and they are all on the same vein here. Um, and it's from By Common Consent. Now, by common consent is kind of a progressive Mormon blog. And on August 16, 2022, Angela C. wrote about the psycho, uh, the psycho, uh, psychology of the confessional. And what this blog arg- argues is that LDS bishops do not have priest penitent privilege. And this is a very controversial. Uh, this is a very controversial article. And um, I just want to go over what their argument is. I'm not necessarily saying that this is a correct argument. I'm just going to go over what they are saying. So the reason that they are arguing in this article that LDS bishops do not have a priest penitent privilege is for a couple of reasons. Number one. LDS, uh, you know, every ward has what is called a ward council. Al, Al, what is a ward council, by the way? Okay, so a ward council is basically the leadership of the ward. Um, <clears throat> of course, there's the bishop and his two counselors. There's the ward clerk, um, but there's also the auxiliary leaders. As you know, let's see. And th- this would uh, this would certainly change since they've reorganized things. But uh, there was the young men's uh, president, the young women's president, um, and you know, relief society, relief society, uh, primary. Yeah, yeah, all the auxiliaries of, of the church, and uh, they meet together and they discuss uh, what's going on with uh, the the members of their congregations, and um, yeah. Now, I know that that's a good sum up. I know that bishops are not supposed to bring up in these meetings personal um, items that are that they receive during confessionals, but there has been a lot of stories, including myself. I've been in on ward councils myself, where things were shared that were probably uh, done in, in confessionals or, or were very private and were brought up to the ward council as a whole. Now, I know that that is technically not in accordance with the church handbook and other things, but has have you ever been a part of that, Al? Um, not personally myself, but I do, I do know that it happens. Yeah, it does happen, it. and it is all too common. So that's number one, is you have a ward council where a bishop can potentially be telling other members of the auxiliaries uh, private information, and that does happen from time to time. Number two, that's a theoretical thing, That, by the way, that ward council. But as an actuality, the disciplinary councils, so a disciplinary council, if you're a male in the church who holds the Melchizedek priesthood and you're going to be disciplined, then it needs to come before the stake high council, uh, 12 elders, and the bishop will tell those elders what was uh, spoken, it, let's say that you went in, confessed to your bishop about something that you did. Say, I don't know, I murdered someone 15 years ago. Well, if that person, you could have a disciplinary council for them in which the rest of the members of the disciplinary council will be informed as to what happened or what was confessed or what your transgression was. So that's number two of possibly breaking the priest penitent privilege. Now, number three uh, also is called the ecclesiastical endorsement. Now, if you are an employee for the church, either working at the church headquarters or the CES, which is the seminaries or the institute system, or in any capacity working as in a paid position for the church uh, as an employee or at BYU, you have to maintain an ecclesiastical endorsement. So when you go into your bishop, you answer certain questions to make sure that you're following church guidelines and that you have proper, basically you have proper uh, behaviors and also that you... Um, I believe in the proper church doctrines, you know, that you're not an apostate. And I can tell you from working a long time for the church, I worked either part time or full time for the church for almost 24 years. I can tell you that if you confess something to your bishop in a confessional that makes it so that you are ineligible for an ecclesiastical endorsement, you will lose your job. So that is yet a third item in which the priest penitent privilege does not apply to an LDS bishop. And then the fourth one, is that uh, I know I'm going off on a tangent. I want to hear what you guys have to say. But this is the fourth one and the final one from the article. It says that Latter Day Saint bishops take presidents, branch presidents. They usually serve for terms of four, five to seven years uh, these days at most. That's unlike most other clergy. A Catholic priest is usually for life, and many other clergies from uh, churches are are, uh, are usually for long periods of time, or maybe even for life. And because bishops only serve for shorter periods of time, 
after they're done with their term, um, you know, they, they are they can tell other people what happened. I know they can. They don't. A lot of them don't. Most of them don't. But these are just four items in which LDS bishops are far different than Catholic priests when it comes to the priest penitent privilege. So uh, that's why I want to ask you, John, do you do you feel that there's a significant difference between the confidentiality of an LDS bishop versus a Catholic priest? Or is, are, are we grasping at straws here? That's a great question. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of theological difference and there are, there's some practical differences as well. In a statutory legal sense, you know, most, you know, the, the actual language varies from state to state. I, I you know, I looked at some statutes, um, you know, recently, you know, a lot of them simply refer to a member of the clergy. Some states actually talk a little bit more about, you know, a sacramental confession or something like that, but most states simply say a member of the clergy. So, you know, are bishops members of the clergy? Well, yes and no, right? But they might be the, in, in a way, they might be the closest thing that the LDS church has to clergy, even if they're temporarily clergy. Um, so, you know, I, I would presume in court, they're, you know, that they're commonly have been accepted as clergy. What do you know? Um, <laughs> yeah, with, with regards to the, uh, like the way the, clergy runs, it seems like uh, the the big difference that I see in um, LDS clergy versus, um, let's say, uh, Catholic uh, clergy um, or other, uh, you know, denominational Christian uh, clergy would be that uh, <clears throat> the uh, the LDS church doesn't pay their bishops. Um, so, you know, uh, so bishops are completely volunteer, um, even though it's, you know, assigned work, it's unpaid work, it's volunteer work. And, um, you know, uh, that's why, you know, when it comes to like the Catholic priests, uh, that's their whole life. Uh, you know, they right. go, they go sure. to school, they study counseling, they study theology, they study history, they study, you know, all kinds of different things. Um, because this is their life's work, although they're going to be for the rest of their life as a priest, they're not a priest that's an accountant during the week or, or, you know, a doctor during the week or, <clears throat> you know, or a plumber, or wh whatever it might be. Um, and yeah, uh, Dives is right, is that uh, there's, um, you know, a bish an LDS bishop is in that position for a period of five to seven years, uh, typically, and then they move on. Um, and th they just don't get that same kind of training. They don't get the same kind of education. Um, so I feel like, uh, if anything, the LDS uh, clergy are far uh, less equipped to handle the the same type of situation as uh, a a, a, con, a a clergy member of a comparable religion. Yeah, I mean, it's a pretty radical article, and I'm sure from a legal perspective that uh, LDS bishops are going to be granted in general the priest penitent privilege. It's like we saw in the mm -hmm. Arizona case. They, they they didn't revoke the priest penitent privilege because of the arguments that are made by this particular blog post. They, they revoked it because yeah. they posted it online. And I, I just I, I just wanted – I think that the article, from, just from a theoretical perspective, brings up a couple of interesting points. I, I don't think they're legally sound points, but they're uh, – from a thought perspective, a thought exercise exercise, I think that there is significant differences. And that in some way, it feels like it should be acknowledged, but in, I don't see how it can be, you know? Yeah. yeah. So, well, I mean, it, it, it definitely points to a big ecclesiastical difference, really, between the, mm -hmm. um, the LDS church and, you know, most other branches of Christianity, just, you know, the, the lay, you know, the lay leadership, um, you know, all the things that, that you pointed to. Um, mm -hmm. it's a, it's a, it's a fascinating, you know, I, I think most, most, um, non Mormons would have no idea that Latter-day Saints don't have paid clergy. Um, you know, it's, a, it is, a, it is a huge, huge difference. At the mm -hmm. local level, they do not have a paid right. clergy, right? Yeah, exactly. Um, I, and I just want to say one last thing about it. There is a significant amount of pressure that you feel when your bishop, when, when you work for the church and your bishop controls your employment, that's a dynamic that is really, I, I don't know what other thing could be comparable to that. Knowing that if I go into my bishop and I confess something that I could lose my job, uh, there's just not a lot of other 
at least that I'm aware of, denominations or other circumstances in which you could go to your clergy and confess something, and then he would go tell your employer, I'm sorry, he did this, and you're going to fire him. That would never happen in the Catholic Church. So that's why I'm saying that there is a significant difference between the uh, practical application of the LDS bishop uh, priest penitent privilege and many other denominations. Okay. Um, okay, I think we beat that one up. We're now we're down to our last article here, um, which is uh, we saved the best for last, I guess. And this was our clickbait article for the week. So this is, um, <laughs> I hate to, I hate to laugh about this, but it's what the it, church. It's can, a good one. <laughs> <it's>, <laughs> uh, hopefully, John's like, well, uh, okay. So it's what the church can learn from Victoria's Secret. What the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints can learn about child sex abuse response from Victoria's Secret. Now, this was on August 14, 2022, and it again is from a progressive Mormon blog called The Exponent by Katie Ludlow Rich. Uh, John, you're you're reconsidering me teaching this Mormonism course. I can tell already, right? I mean. Well, you know, you have to attract <laughs> students, I guess. <laughs> okay, so this is the clickbait title here. So all I can say is, hey, this appeared, guys, in my newsfeed. This is the Google, and somehow the Google algorithm knows me all too well. I don't, I don't know how. I mean, I clicked on this newsfeed article faster than you could say tithing declaration. Now, I've heard it been said in the past that a person's uh, personalized Google News feed is based on their previous search history, but I would like to publicly and strongly refute that. There's no evidence for that, okay? So now, let's get into the meat of this article. Uh, although now that I'm thinking about it, when it comes to Victoria's Secret, there's not a lot of meat on that bone, but let's cover the article because it is not just clickbait. I clicked on it and expected it to be uh, amusing and, uh, and uh but, but it wasn't. It was actually a really good article. So here, let me summarize this for you and uh, for our listeners out there. And I think we can learn something from this. In fact, I think President Russell M. Nelson can learn uh, quite a bit about child sex abuse response from this Victoria's, uh, from, from Victoria's Secret. So the article outlines Jax, who is a singer and an influencer who released a, cri a single that was critical of Victoria's Secret and other media outlets who perpetuate unrealistic female body standards. And she wrote the song, uh, quote, I know Victoria's Secret, end quote, to address how girls are manipulated into unhealthy thoughts and actions. And the song went viral. And it's really taking a critical look at Victoria's Secret uh, and, and some of their... Um, you know, really some, somewhat negative uh, body perception uh, practices. So this uh, has gone viral. And the CEO of Victoria's Secret, uh, Amy Hauk, she responded on Instagram. Um, and uh, what was her response there? Uh, we'll link this in the show notes, by the way. This is article number uh, six in the show notes. What did she respond back to, Al, uh, to this, uh, to Jax, the uh, person with the single uh, regarding this? So well, can you characterize what Amy's response was? Okay. So her response here was, um, let's see. Well, it's a hand, hand first of the, all. The hand, yeah, hand, the problem is it's handwritten. Okay. So, uh, hand, she, well, yeah. Can you just summarize it? Summarize yeah, it. What, okay. what did Amy say? Yeah, she said, uh, Dear uh, Victoria's Secret community, Jax's latest single, Victoria's Secret, has re resonated with many of her fans, including me. I want to thank Jax for addressing important issues in her lyrics. We make no excuses for the past. And um, let's see, then she, her head's kind of covering it. But she uh, basically says that, you know. We're committed, uh, we're committed yeah. to regaining your trust. The full, yeah, uh, our, the exactly. full, the full note is at the bottom, by the way. Okay. So this is a personal handwritten note where she says that everyone needs to be respected and seen. We don't make any excuses, and we're sorry that we let you down. Mm -hmm. And uh, we truly value your voice, and we're working for ways to listen to you and bring you into the conversation. I mean, it's just a handwritten note. It's really heartfelt. And, it, and she tweeted it directly back to Jax and said, thank you, Jax, for sharing your truth. To everyone yeah. out there living authentically and bravely every day, we see you, we hear you, we need to do better. I mean, mm -hmm. this is this is the kind of personalized, um, heartfelt note from uh, unflattering media coverage that I think that the church could really, uh, you know, John, is there? Do you think that the church can learn anything from this article about how to respond to viral and unflattering media coverage? Is there any takeaways? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, I guess. Well, I guess just the only thing that comes to mind is this is not really um, in direct response to that, but just in, you know, there's sort of a PR answer to your question and there's like the moral, what's the right thing to do. It's just in terms of PR. I love a lot of the things that um, Pope Francis does around the world in his travels right. in terms of really meeting 
in a heartfelt way with ordinary folks. And, you know, I, I imagine the, that president Nelson and other top church leaders do, do that kind of thing too, as, as well. The more of that, the, the better, you know, it just sets a good tone and yeah, you know, I mean, this sort of direct engagement in a heartfelt way with people, um, I mean, sure. I mean, I think it'd probably be, it, it wouldn't be too hard for, it wouldn't be that easy for the, the, you know, to, for the church to pick and choose who to, who did, how and when to do that. But sure. It's a fun article. Yeah. I mean, I think, I think what you said, John, is Pope Francis, he's basically not afraid to make himself seem vulnerable and very yeah. approachable. And that's yeah. also what you get from this, from the Victoria's Secret CEO is a vulnerability, opening yourself up and saying, you know, I, I feel I empathize with you on a human level. And that's what I think Pope Francis gets gets right. And I think that the church could really learn from uh, both of these. Al, what, what, did you get anything from this uh, article? Oh, I, absolutely. I, I, uh, I think that's exactly what uh, the lesson is, is uh, the church can be vulnerable. It can, <clears throat> excuse me, the church can, uh, or the church leaders, I should say, uh, can be human. And people are willing to accept apologies. They're willing to uh, forgive people that have done wrong. Um, and you'd be surprised just how much people can <clears throat> can forgive and are willing to forgive. But, uh, you know, the church has often for so long uh, held up this um, this front of infallibility that they refuse to apologize. They refuse to acknowledge any uh, wrongdoing. And I think that, you know, uh, for a prime example is uh, Pope Francis. Uh, he visited Canada this last year and um, approached the indigenous peoples and offered us a heartfelt, sincere apology for the murders that happened to those indigenous children that were taken and put in Catholic schools, um, you know, so many years ago. And this is, you know, probably even before he was born in some instances, a lot of these kids were, were murdered, but he, he apologized, you know, he said, you know, I'm sorry that, you know, this is not fair what happened and it's okay to, to do that. The Catholic church survived that and they will survive it. You know, and the, the LDS church can survive it too, but, um, it's a lot harder to survive it if you keep up this, you know, us, what, um, this stubborn front of infallibility because nobody's infallible. We're all human. Yeah. And this, uh, thanks uh, for your perspective. This mm -hmm. goes into our Mormon News Roundup question of the week, which is available only on Anchor. And you can go over there and we have this is the question that we'd like you to respond to. Uh, what, what, is, what can the LDS Church learn? about how to respond to negative child sex abuse coverage from Victoria's Secret. And I know that seems kind of, kind of like a silly question, but it actually, it's pretty profound in my opinion. So, mm -hmm. uh, hey, John, we wanted to thank you so much for coming onto the program yeah. and, uh, and for ruminating with us on the Great and Spacious Beehive. And, uh, you know, we wish you the very best with your, uh, with your works uh, that, you're, that you're writing on Joseph Smith. We're going to be looking forward to, uh, to reading that. Uh, the, the title of that book, No Man Knows My History, Part 2, or what, what is the title? What is your working title there? Um, I'm still working on the working title, oh, okay. so I'll have to get back to you. <laughs> <laughs> okay, very well. Well, we'll be looking forward to but, that. Uh, no, no Man Knows My History, Volume 2. So it's got my vote, so there's a good working title for how you. About, how about This Man Knows His History? <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Excellent. Okay, very All good. Right, very good. Certainly. Okay, so we want to give a, a shout out to our uh, friend Weird Alma for allowing us to use his uh, music for our episodes. And uh, so we'll play out with that. And um, remember, no unhallowed hand can stop this podcast from progressing. We'll see you next week. When it comes to nicknames of the church, such as LDS Church, the Mormon Church, to remove the Lord's name from the Lord's Church is a major victory for Satan. 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 Please allow me to introduce myself. I'm a being with no moral constraints. My number one goal is to hurt the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints.